Good morning and welcome to my weekly podcast, Through the Bible in 10 Years. And today we are in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 gives us the actual birth of Jesus. In Luke 1, of course, we have Luke's uh, prologue to Theophilus, setting out what he's about to do, giving this history of the the, uh, Jesus movement, as it were. And then we have the announcement to Zechariah that his wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to a son, even though they're well advanced in years and would not normally biologically be able to conceive or give birth at that age. But it happens. And uh, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And then Gabriel, the angel, comes to Mary and announces to her that she will also uh, give birth to a son and that um, his name well, Matthew says his name will be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and in the end of chapter one, John the Baptist is born. Now, we didn't really talk last week about, or the previous two weeks, we didn't really talk about the virginal conception. Now, Matthew highlights that Mary is a virgin, and I believe that Luke also assumes that Mary has not slept with Joseph before or anyone before Jesus is conceived and born, or, or born. And so um, we call this virginal uh, conception. Now, a virgin birth um, is sometimes understood slightly differently. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and I think the Orthodox traditions, understand uh, the, the birth itself to be virginal, which, which is a little, uh, for me as a Protestant, it's a little strange concept. Um, for one, uh, I don't consider sex or birth to in any way make a person unclean. Now, I realize when I say that, that there are, the Old Testament does indeed consider these things to to make a woman unclean for a period of time. Not not sinful, but it is understood to make unclean. But, um, and again, I realize this is a a particular uh, uh, reading of the Bible. In my understanding, the New Testament um, makes those rules about clean and unclean kind of abolishes them. When, when we talk about what what is the wall of separation uh, that Ephesians talks about being torn down between Jew and Gentile? Well, some of those things, which have sometimes been referred to as the ceremonial law, are torn down. Um, that that uh, birth uh, does not make a woman uh, unclean. Um, menstruation no longer makes a woman unclean. Those were things that I would suggest had a lot to do with the particular paradigms of uh, ancient Israel, the Levitical paradigms, as it were. Um, And there's no indication that I can see in the New Testament uh, that uh, the clean and unclean uh, uh, kosher codes of the Old Testament are binding upon, uh, especially on non-Jewish Christians, but perhaps not even on Jewish Christians either. Um, We have, of course, in Acts 10, Uh, where Peter gets the vision, you know, don't call anything that I've cleansed unclean. There is no indication whatsoever in Luke chapter 2 that Mary's birth in any way makes her unclean. And there is no indication in Luke 2 that Mary's birth is, uh, requires her to remain, uh, what would it mean to remain a virgin through your birth? Well, it's usually interpreted to mean that, that her her anatomy, her physical anatomy, her hymen, for example, remained intact, that Jesus miraculously comes out of her without any of the the, uh, virginal anatomy being disturbed. Do I believe that's possible? Absolutely, I believe that's possible. There's simply no biblical reason to think that happened. And in fact, as we saw when we went through the Gospel of Mark, um, Uh, Mary seems to go on to have other children. Again, that would be disputed in certain circles. But in terms of the Bible itself, uh, uh, there is no indication whatsoever uh, that Mary uh, remained a virgin the rest of her life. And why would she need to? It doesn't doesn't make you in any way inferior or unclean to have children. That process is not a dirty process. Sex is not dirty. These are um, parts of certain ancient worldviews, but it's not part of, of the New Testament uh, paradigm and worldview, in my, in my opinion. And so there, there is no reason to think that Mary remains a virgin after uh, she conceives uh, Jesus. 
So what we really mean, what Protestants really mean when Protestants call it the virgin birth, but what we really mean is the virginal conception. And by the virginal conception, we mean um, that Mary conceived Jesus apart from human sex, that Joseph or no human male was involved in uh, uh, the birth, the, the conception of, of Jesus. Now that's, that's even that a little different from say Isaiah 7, 14, where, uh, and I have videos uh, on those passages. In Isaiah 7, 14, in its original context, um, Isaiah is talking to King Ahaz about a political threat from the north. Um, the kings of Syria and the kings of Israel are, are conspiring against the king of Judah to the south. And Isaiah says to Ahaz, well, the Lord's going to take care of this. Don't don't feel like you have to go to Egypt for support. Don't feel like you have to solve this through uh, visible political means. God's going to take care of this. And in fact, ask the Lord for a sign and the Lord will give you a sign. And Ahaz doesn't want a sign. Ahaz wants a political partnership that he can see. <laughs> he doesn't want to trust what he can't see. And Isaiah in frustration says, fine, the Lord's going to give you a sign anyway. A young lady is going to, a maiden, somebody who's a, a virgin, is going to conceive and give birth to a son. And before that son is old enough to tell the difference between right and wrong, God will have taken care of these kings to the north. And that took place. Uh, unfortunately, it took place because the king of Assyria came and pounced on the kings to the north. But, but basically, um, this th there was a first meaning to that passage. And the first meaning to that passage seems to have been fulfilled in the days of Ahaz. After all, if it's assigned to Ahaz, it's not very helpful if it only takes uh, comes to pass 700 years later. So this is this sense of multiple layers of scripture, multiple fulfillments uh, that are possible. First fulfillment in the days of Isaiah, and then a fuller sense or a spiritual sense, what's sometimes called a census plenier, where this passage comes true in the birth of the virginal conception of Jesus. And so the virginal conception of Jesus is unique and different from Isaiah or um, say what a virgin birth uh, would, would be. The virginal conception of Jesus is, is that Mary becomes pregnant without ever having sex with any man. Um, and so um, um, she becomes pregnant from the Holy Spirit as it were, not in a sexual sense, there were plenty of birth stories of Zeus visiting women and then becoming pregnant. That's not what the virginal conception is in Matthew and Luke. It is that, that by mir miracle, Mary becomes pregnant with Jesus, even though she has not um, slept with any, any human man. By the way, that can happen uh, very, 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 very rarely, but it's always a woman that is born. Um, because what happens is the the, the uh, a woman's genetic material doubles, as it were, and so it's like it's like cloning herself. Um, apparently, this is a thing. I've never heard of it. I mean, I've never heard of a specific example of it, but apparently, it can happen. But a virgin birth cannot give birth. Uh, a virginal conception of that sort cannot give birth to a um, a male child because it's doubling the the X chromosome. So this is a miracle. Uh, an incredible miracle, obviously, uh, a virgin birth um, and a sign. I think it's Tom Wright that suggests that this is a sign um, of the um, the momentousness of this birth. And I've said, I think, in my previous two videos on Luke, that um, there was a sense that a person's birth should give indications of what this person is going to go on to do and to become. And so it would be expected in that world that if Jesus were to turn out to be the Messiah, even the Son of God, as we know he was and is, um, that there would be um, momentous things that would accompany um, his birth. And so the virgin birth is definitely, or virgin conception, is definitely a sign of, of the momentousness of this event of Jesus uh, arriving from heaven to earth. John, of course, uh, in John 1.14 will introduce the concept of the incarnation. We don't, you know, as the, the virgin conception in Matthew and Luke doesn't say what happened before. We get a little bit, this is where we get a little bit from each of the gospels. Mark doesn't even talk about the birth of Jesus. 
There's no mention of the virgin birth explicitly in the Gospel of Mark. There's one passage where it might be implied that Jesus had existed uh, before he took on human flesh in his uh, Mark 12, where he's answering questions. And uh, Jesus says, uh, if David calls uh, the Messiah Lord, then how can the Messiah be David's son? It, which could be a hint that Jesus existed before or that the Messiah existed before uh, David even. But Mark in general doesn't mention uh, the virgin birth. Paul never explicitly mentions the, the virgin uh, conception. Um, it's in Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke are really the only places in the New Testament where the virginal conception is, is mentioned. And by the way, this shows that um, even though we may not realize it, we have uh, church glasses. Everybody wears church glasses. And what, by that I mean is the virgin conception is very important in, in our Christian understanding. It's in the Apostles' Creed, you know, born of the Virgin Mary. Um, and, um, but, but in terms of the New Testament itself, in terms, especially the New Testament as a literary document, that is the text of the New Testament as we have it, the text of the New Testament as we have it does not highlight the virgin conception. It only appears in these two places, uh, in Matthew and, and uh, Luke. And so um, it's interesting, our church glasses, our Christian glasses, see the virgin birth as a much more momentous uh, theological uh, uh, data point uh, than uh, the New Testament itself uh, treats the, the virgin conception. Uh, I, I am uh, struck again with N.T. Wright's sense of the virgin birth as a sign. Um, I'm not sure that the virgin conception does what uh, some would, would say it does. So what I'm getting at, uh, let me just mention two things. Some would say, well, the virgin birth was necessary uh, in order for Jesus to be divine. Well, I'm not sure that line of thought really follows through because uh, Jesus is fully human and fully divine, right? That's what the Chalcedonian um, uh, uh, Council of Chalcedon, Chalcedon in 451 finalized that understanding that Jesus is 100% human and Jesus is 100% divine. And so, um, Jesus has to have a human X and a human Y chromosome, right? So I, I'm, I, I, have a sen I have a sneaking suspicion that those who say Jesus had to be born of a virgin in order for him to, divine, to be divine um, are, are not intentionally, but accidentally suggesting that Jesus is a demigod rather than fully God. You know, well, he's got his X chromosome. This is the line of thought. He, he would have his X chromosome from Mary, which is him, him being human. And then he would have his Y chromosome from the Holy Spirit, which would make him divine. Well, we do know that he has his Y chromosome from the Holy Spirit, but it's a human Y chromosome. And, and it's not a special Y chromosome, I don't think. Um, I mean, maybe it, Jesus is not Hercules. Jesus is a unique, fully human, fully divine uh, person. Um, and so um, there were a number of, I mean, God, I assume, and again, I'm, this is way above our pay grade. It's above my pay grade and it's above your pay grade. So who knows, maybe in some mysterious way that, that we can't possibly imagine, it was important for the Holy Spirit to make the Y chromosome. But on the face of it, it would seem that Jesus could be fully God and have God uh, make all the genetic material. So God make, God, Jesus could have been basically have manufactured like Adam, right? Um, he didn't have to be born of any human parentage and be fully human. God could have gone and Jesus been fully human. So God could have completely manufactured both the X and Y chromosome, or um, both X and Y chromosome could have come from a purely human um, uh, uh, generation and then Jesus be fully divine. Or the way God did it, uh, Mary contributed the X, the human X chromosome, and God, the Holy Spirit, um, uh, in, uh, or, um, invented, originated the human Y chromosome. You see what I'm saying? That Jesus is not a half God, half man person, which is when you hear some people talk about Jesus needing to, needing to be born of a virgin in order for him to be uh, divine and human, it almost sounds like they're saying that Jesus is like Hercules. Um, that's not the case. He is fully human with a human X and a human Y chromosome. 
and he's fully divine and and that's above our pay grade because i don't know exactly how those two cohere but it, it it is not clear to me and again i'm just a caveman you know i'm not i'm not uh omniscient by any means or nowhere close to being uh, super 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 brilliant on 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 this level um i'm simply saying that it's not clear that the virgin birth does that uh because because Jesus has both an X and a, a human X and a human Y uh, chromosome. The other thing that you sometimes hear is that Jesus had to be born of a virgin um, so that he was without sin. Well, I'm not sure that sin resides on the Y chromosome. If, if sin did reside, reside on the Y chromosome, then women would be without sin. And we all know that's not true, right? I mean, anyway, no offense to women, but, but um, there is no clear genetic marker for sin. Um, and so um, whatever, whatever it is um, that, that allows Jesus to be born uh, without sin, um, well, the other thing is, is that um, sin is not intrinsic to human flesh. Um, we are not sinful because of our genetics. There is nothing in our DNA that, that uh, constitutes the sin gene. Uh, sin is a power. Uh, Paul talks about sin as a power that reigns over our flesh. Our flesh is weak, um, but our flesh is not sinful, not according to Paul, not intrinsically. Otherwise, uh, Adam could, would have intrinsically been, you know, we could, we could talk about, well, his DNA was corrupted when he sinned, and Jesus had DNA that wasn't. Um, that wasn't corrupted. But then how is Jesus fully human if, if corruption is somehow intrinsic to uh, humanity? Um, basically, we sin like Adam because we're under the power of sin in the world brought on by Adam. Uh, but I do not find any good, and we'll get to Romans eventually in this series, I do not find any good basis in Romans to say that we are either held under the guilt of Adam um, or that uh, we have some um, biological basis uh, uh, of inherited sin. We, we have experienced the consequences of original sin. The consequences of original sin is that the power of sin rules over our flesh. Um, and so when we say that Jesus was without sin, we are saying that the power of sin never ruled over Jesus's flesh. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit um, uh, made him impervious to, well, I mean, he was tempted, right? Hebrews 4, he was tempted like we are. So he wasn't impervious to temptation. Uh, he wasn't impervious to the power of sin in that respect. The power of sin had an effect on Jesus in temptation, but um, there was no intrinsic, uh, there was no sin act uh, that took place in Jesus. Well, okay, so all of that is to say is um, I certainly believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe in the virgin conception. I believe it was a miracle. I believe that the Holy Spirit uh, manufactured his Y chromosome, that Jesus was both fully human um, and fully divine. I believe all these things. And the function, I think, primarily of the virgin conception is as a sign that indeed Jesus is who he says it is. It's not a, it's not a biological necessity or a theological. It, it's not a theological necessity, I would say. Um, it is the way God chose to do it as an indication of, of the momentousness of the birth of, of Jesus. It has a symbolic function, I think. Now, there may be stuff I'm missing. I don't claim to be, uh, again, um, right on all these things. I'm, I'm doing the musings, the musings of someone for whom a lot of the kind of easy explanations that are given sometimes from our pulpits um, have unraveled. Um, and so... I process these things and come out with faith and come out with believing in the virgin conception, but also um, uh, sometimes I, uh, I, my head sags when I hear um, things that seem to me to not actually hold up very well under examination. Well, okay, it may be I'm who's wrong. Well, let's dive in. We're now beginning verse one. And it happened in those days. So, um, very Lucan kind of thing to say, right? Um, that a decree, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. My King James, you know, wants to kick in here. 
So a dogma, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to register all the inhabited world, the oikumene, the human economy, to register it. Now we do have evidence of uh, a census under Augustus. Uh, there are some uh, historical complications here that I'll come back to. Uh, I'll just mention in a second, but um, uh, Augustus was the first uh, Roman emperor. Uh, his, his adopted father, Julius Caesar, um, was on track to become the first uh, Roman emperor, but he was, as you may know, assassinated in 44 BC. And that set in motion more civil war. Uh, there was um, a pretty rough time of it in the mid middle of the first century BC in Rome. And by the time Augustus uh, consolidated his rule, um, he, it was in the year 27 that he was fully ruling over um, the Roman Empire. I think he may have started that process around the year 31 BC. And um, people were, uh, um, you know, for good or ill, I would say, unfortunately, um, the Roman people were willing to do away with the Republic. Um, uh, in exchange for peace. And, and Augustus was welcomed as a, um, someone who brought peace to the world. Uh, there are a number of inscriptions that have been discovered, uh, mostly in Turkey, um, in relation to Augustus. Um, uh, one of them, the Priene inscription. Priene is a place not far from Ephesus. It's a place that Luke may very well have visited at some time. The Priene inscription uh, talks about the gospel of Augustus, the good news of Augustus. Um, there was another um, inscription called the, the Race Gestae Dewi Augustus, the, um, the, the, what is it, the honorable things of the divine Augustus that talk about how he, he stopped uh, all of the uh, piracy and he uh, helped make it safe to travel on the land. And uh, again, he's called divine. There's another one uh, in Myra, uh, which is mentioned as a place Paul and Luke visited on their way to, to Jerusalem. Um, uh, the Myron, Myrian uh, inscription um, talks about how uh, Augustus was the son of a god. Um, and so there is a, uh, I think, I, I really do believe that Luke wants Theophilus and his readers to see Jesus as a counter Augustus. Now, he does not in any way play up um, competition or subversion. That's definitely not what Luke wants to do here. But, but I think the parallel is, uh, is almost unavoidable if you're an ancient Roman. Now, the, now, of course, Augustus dies, I think, in 14 AD. And so um, this is in the long, long in the past, uh, by the time uh, Luke is writing, you know, some probably 60 some years after, uh, maybe 70 years after Augustus has passed. Um, and so that's, it's in the distant past, but um, uh, uh, Luke wants uh, Theophilus and his audience to know that um, uh, Rome's not the only thing going, that at the same time that Rome was getting started as an empire, also Jesus came to earth. And um, there is a global sense. I mean, the Roman Empire wasn't the whole world. It was basically the Mediterranean world. But there, that it was the whole world for the Romans. It was a big, vast world uh, for the Romans. Um, and so um, at the same time that the inhabited world, the whole inhabited world, was uh, coming under the rule of Augustus uh, and being an, an account being taken, Jesus, the whole world, was uh, beginning to see Jesus under whom the whole world would also come together unto salvation. Of course, what is the theme of Acts? You will be my witnesses in, in Ju uh, Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there's a, there is a, a global sco scope to the gospel um, as for both Augustus and um, Jesus in terms of that world, the way they thought of the world. Obviously, it's China wasn't on anybody's map pretty much at this time and, and so forth. Uh, Indonesia was not known to these individuals. But so, so it's there within their framework, um, a parallel universality. Um, now, it is generally agreed by everybody that Jesus was born under 
the reign of Augustus. So that that is a, a agreed thing. The, the census, uh, there are some historical uh, uh, complications here. Uh, so Augustus did call for uh, a census at some point. Um, however, it's not agreed that that, is census, that census was for the whole world, that um, it's not agreed that there was a universal census uh, at the same time. So we can say the same thing for verse two here. This registration first uh, came to pass while Cyrenius uh, was governing Syria. Well, again, there, there are arguments that can be made for uh, this uh, happening at the time when, Je so Jesus bore, was born under the reign of Herod the Great. Herod the Great seems to have died in 4 BC. Well, Cyrenius seems to have governed Syria in 6 AD. At least this is, this is the way that historians tend to date Cyrenius. And so there are various um, strategies that are employed um, to try to, um, to handle this apparent historical discrepancy. You know, maybe Cyrenius was governor before Cyrenius was governor the time we knew. Um, and so uh, that's one suggestion. Another suggestion is that, that maybe, you know, there was a census we didn't know about um, uh, in addition to the censuses that we do know about, or maybe Josephus is wrong, you know, and other sources are wrong. Um, I tend not to want to get into um, trying to fix these historical difficulties. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why I don't, I kind of like, it's, it's, I know it's frustrating, but I just kind of let it lie. And I ask, so what is, what are we trying, what does Luke want us to get out of, what is the inspired intention of this text, which is very difficult because then you're trying to read God's mind, but what is basically Luke and God trying to get at um, in these verses? I think one, it is a mistake to think that um, getting the historical details uh, in sync with history, I think there is a little bit of modern anachronism to that. I think that um, as we go through Luke and as we've gone through Acts, that that um, Luke actually is not uh, constrained by modern historical concerns, that there's artistry to Luke's presentation and that there was nothing wrong, there was nothing considered erroneous. Um, uh, a lot of times when people talk about errors, what, what it constitutes an error in the Bible, what doesn't constitute an, an error in the Bible, they assume that their definition of an error is what counts. It's kind of a a subtle um, narcissism there. Um, I personally believe that when we're asking what would be an error, what would be a historical error, we have to ask, well, what, what was the nature and what were the limits of ancient history writing? What, were they, what was a historian allowed to do uh, back then? Now, I can't remember if I met, mentioned Thucydides yet, but Thucydides was a very good Greek historian of the 300s BC. And Thucydides tells us in his introduction that there were some occasions that he wasn't present for and that he couldn't find sources for. And so he says, I've composed speeches that I think would have been appropriate for those occasions. He tells us without any, in fact, he apologizes for not being more sensational than he is, for not being more entertaining than he is. He basically says, I'm, I'm mostly sticking to the way it happened. So I apologize if that's not uh, you know, that may not be as, you know, as much fun as what you want, you know, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to stick pretty much to what happened. And, but even then he says, but I have made up some speeches um, when I didn't know what was actually said on a particular occasion. Well, we would say, well, what a horrible historian Thucydides is. You know, you can't make up speeches, but again, it's not what, what, what is appropriate for our context. That, that is the standard for these sorts of things. It's what history writing was like in their time. And I believe that um, from, from looking at some of these ancient histories, that um, there was an allowance for a little bit of, of, of artistry, of shuffling some things around to make the presentation more compelling or, or clear, the message more clearer and, and so forth. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna say that that's what's happening here. I'm, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna let it, I'm gonna let it hang uh, because um, uh, uh, ancient history is not the same as modern history. And the other thing is, is I think sometimes, um, sometimes we say we're interested in the truth and we're not. 
Uh, we're interested when we say we're interested in the truth. What we mean is we're interested in simply finding a way, maybe a very very clever way, to support what we already think. But that's not that's not defending the truth. That's defending tradition, and um, and that's if if you're a really open, if you're a person who really is interested in the truth, that's a one way ticket to a faith crisis. Um, God believes what is true, and that's what we should aim at. Um, and and so. That involves uh, keeping somewhat of an open mind to uh, some of these issues. It's it doesn't necessarily mean trying to fix every potential uh, discrepancy in the text. Well, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm I'm uh, I'm basically pointing out here, and I think Joel Green says this in his commentary that that um, Luke is situating the birth of Jesus in a in a rough context. And that whether it is the exact date, you know, uh, of Cyrenius and, and so forth, or Cyrenius' census, whether, whether it fits exactly is not really the point. That the point is really to situate Jesus' birth within a particular historical global context uh, of, the Roman, of the Roman Empire. And, and um, people to whom Luke was writing would have been generally aware of that context. Again, they didn't have Google to look up things on Wikipedia. They didn't even have access to historical books. You couldn't go to Amazon and buy a book on, you know, Judea during a, the Augustan period. You know, it just didn't exist. And so, um, um, the, the purpose is to situate the general timing and the the political context and the theological context of Jesus' birth. And so, you know, I, I don't worry too much about trying to iron out all these things. Uh, I have a book called The Birth of the Messiah by Raymond Brown. He's rather blunt uh, in there. It is a classic. Um, Raymond Brown, I may have mentioned, was a Roman Catholic scholar. He's passed now, but he, 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 uh, he holds no punches in processing some of these historical issues. For example, verse three, and all were going to be registered, each to his own city. Well, Brown says, we have no evidence that this was a requirement. Um, um, and so against that backdrop, we should probably conclude that if Joseph went to Bethlehem, he did it because he wanted to, um, not because he necessarily had to, because of the stipulations uh, of the census. So verse four, and also Joseph went up from Galilee into the city, uh, from the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and lineage of David. Now, both Matthew and Luke and the New Testament agree that Jesus was from the lineage of David. Uh, even Paul says this in Romans 1, 3, where he says, um, who was um, uh, from the seed of David according to the flesh. So Jesus, his CV, his resume, fits that for a Messiah. He is a descendant of David. He can, in fact, be um, the anointed one. He can, indeed, restore the, the kingdom to Israel. And um, uh, I think I mentioned in a previous uh, podcast slash video that, um, remember, I just mentioned Augustus. Augustus was adopted by Julius Caesar, and Julius Caesar treated Augustus as, he as if he was more of his son than his own biological son. I mean, Julius Caesar had biological sons, but Augustus was his, his chosen son. In some ways, Augustus was more special uh, than uh, Ju Julius Caesar's biological children because, um, because Julius chose him and in fact adopted him as an adult, not as a child, but as an adult. Um, and so Joseph's, um, Joseph is the father of Jesus and from their perspective, this makes Jesus from the lineage of, of David one way or another. Now, Luke does have a, a, another genealogy that's a little bit different from Matthew that, that uh, may, may suggest that Mary also um, was descended from David. And we, of course, we, we found out in our uh, last week that um, the fact that Elizabeth, or two weeks ago, the fact that Elizabeth is uh, a descendant of Aaron may, may suggest that Mary also has priestly blood in her. Mary may, Mary may very well biologically be both um, uh, priestly and royal descendant. We may have the, the biology of a king priest, even just in Mary uh, alone as biological source for Jesus' um, 
biological inheritance. Now, um, Matthew is a little bit different uh, than, than Luke here. If all we had were Matthew, Matthew doesn't mention Jesus going from, or Joseph going from Nazareth to Bethlehem. If all we had were Matthew, we would assume that, that Joseph and Mary were from Bethlehem, uh, and that the only reason they ended up in Nazareth was because of Archelaus. Um, in Matthew's story, which we will get to soon enough, um, um, uh, Herod tries to kill the babies in Bethlehem, and this leads Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt. And then after Herod the Great dies in 4 BC, they then uh, come back, but, in, but hearing that Archelaus rules, they don't go back to Bethlehem, they go up to, to Nazareth. So um, again, if we sit somewhat loosely to these issues, I mean, it can be harmonized. You can certainly harmonize um, these accounts. Um, but from a, let's, let's put on our historian's hat. What, are, what is the common ground here? For all the differences between the birth story in Matthew and the birth story of Luke, what are the common, common ground? Well, the common ground is that Jesus uh, grew up in Nazareth and that Jesus was born in Bethlehem um, and that Jesus was born uh, of a virgin. Those, those are the common, the common points for sure uh, between Matthew and Luke. There's a lot of other variation, and that variation uh, can cause some people to be troubled. But, but that's a glass is half empty you know, uh, thing, a view. The, the glass is half full uh, perspective is that there is very, very strong, even though there's, you know, maybe not disagreement, but even though there's variation in the presentation of the birth story, amongst all that variation, there is an agreement that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that Jesus was raised um, in, in Nazareth. So, um, you know, uh, with regard to why would Joseph go down to Bethlehem if the census didn't necessarily require him to? Now, I'm, again, we may find an inscription someday or a scroll someday that's, that basically clears all these um, difficulties, you know, to, and says, oh, if we only knew this, um, you know, we're here for a hundred years, we've been worried about, you know, these difficulties and, and here's the scroll that irons it all out, you know. Um, well, I look forward to that cave, you know, from which we find that scroll. But, um, you know, we, we, can, we can speculate that, that there may have been some shame attached to Mary's pregnancy. She is only betrothed to Joseph. Now, she goes with him down to Bethlehem, um, which um, uh, may suggest that she was already living within his household, not, again, not having sexual relations, but she may already have been living within his household. It may very well have been, again, I'm speculating, that, that uh, Joseph and Mary went down to Bethlehem um, because of the, the stigma um, that attached to uh, a woman who's pregnant and she has not come together with her husband yet. Um, and so it's possible. I mean, some of this, some of this um, uh, hiding away, her going down to Mary, uh, well, of course, she wasn't pregnant when she went down to uh, um uh, or I don't know, we don't know exact, the exact moment of conception in relation, relation to Elizabeth, is the visit to Elizabeth. Um, but it may very well be, I'm just guessing, uh, that going down to Bethlehem um, uh, was a little bit like, uh, why, why attract attention when you don't have to? Let's, let's get out of town and, and um, go down to Bethlehem and, and have the baby born uh, there. And then we won't come back for a while. In, in the Gospel of Matthew, we get the impression that it may have been even a couple of years uh, after Jesus' birth that they went to Nazareth. Uh, because Herod the Great kills the babies uh, that are under two years old, right? Which may suggest that Jesus was born in 6 BC. Okay, so um, Joseph go takes her down to Bethlehem, verse 5, to be registered with Mary. Uh, the one uh, having been betrothed to him and still betrothed. Um, Matthew talks about how he thought about putting her away, uh, divorcing her privately, uh, but he's warned not in a dream not to do that. Um, she being with child, verse six, and it came to pass uh, while they were there, uh, the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. And the days were fulfilled, not just 
uh, for her pregnancy, but also for salvation history, right? Uh, this is what the angels have been eagerly expecting. Verse seven, and she brought forth her son, her firstborn son, her uh, prototokos, her firstborn son. And of course, Jesus is the firstborn uh, son, firstborn in so many different ways. He will be the firstborn from the dead um, later on, but he is the firstborn son of God, uh, eternally begotten of the father, as the creed says. And uh, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and she reclined him in a manger uh, because there was no room for them in the guest room. Uh, a lot of, lot of uh, uh, time spent on this idea of no room in the inn. We picture, you know, Motel 6 um, or, um, I mean, the, the pictures that we have of this, and I have Botticelli's um, manger scene uh, behind me. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the pictures and, and scenes that we paint here come from uh, our, our lack of historical awareness of the way things were. There, there was not likely to be a public inn in Bethlehem. It wasn't a particularly significant place. It was significant in, in the history of Israel because that's where David was from. But in terms of it being, a, it was just a small little village for about four miles south of, uh, of Jerusalem. Um, and it's not a big place at all. It had not become a metropolis, let's, let's say, um, you know, Nowheresville. I mean, it, it's known, it's mentioned in Micah, for example, uh, but it, it's not important, an important place in the Roman Empire. Um, kind of like um, you might you might drive through, where was, I forget where, was Lincoln born in Kentucky? You know, you might, you might uh, I've driven, you know, down, is it 65 in Kentucky? Uh, and, you know, you, you see an exit sign, you know, to Abraham Lincoln's birthplace, but how many people actually go there? I'm sure, you know, probably a lot of people do, uh, but in terms of percentage of the American populace, I imagine a very small percentage of the American populace has actually been to Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. And I, ha I haven't, I haven't been there, uh, even though I've driven past uh, the exit. I may, I think he was born in Kentucky, um, but um, there's some sort of site related to Lincoln uh, in Kentucky. I think on the, on the road to Nashville, if I, from Louisville to Nashville, if I understand, if I remember correctly. But so Bethlehem was not a major place in the world. It was not a significant place, uh, other than the memory that this is a place that David once upon a time, a thousand years earlier, you know, um, had come from. They didn't have a thriving tourist industry, let's just say. Um, and so um, there was no, there was not likely a actual inn and this word, word um, kataluma, is pro probably, uh, there's a nice little article on it, um, it probably refers to a guest room. And, and this would not be a large guest room, uh, not like, you know, I have a, um, uh, we have guest rooms today, right? Uh, with a bed in them and a nightstand and maybe a TV, you know, for if, if you have a guest. Um, even, even our smallest guest rooms would be large compared to what we're probably talking about here. We're talking about an add-on room, probably, uh, to a house. And apparently there's no room in it. Um, um, it's, it's already, maybe somebody's already there um, in that room. And so uh, where they don't, and they, so that's, first of all, it's probably not an inn. It's probably a guest room um, that is referred to here. Secondly, there's no barn. So in our, you know, I'm, I'm in Western Kentucky right now. And before that I lived in, in Indiana, you know, there are plenty of, we know what a barn is and we picture barn, farm animals in a barn. Um, but farm animals were not in a barn in, in the, the typical house. Um, there would be a lower level um, within the house. So you have, you, you might have um, the main level of the house uh, where maybe the guest room would be an attachment um, or, or it could be on the roof. I mean, some have suggested, um, you know, a guest room that's basically you take a little bit more mud, you know, or whatever, and you you, you build a room on the roof. But but um, there there may very well have been a lower level where the sheep and other animals uh, stayed within the house. We don't do it like this. We we allow dogs and cats in our house. We don't allow sheep. And, and those sorts of things in our house or goats in our inside our house um, or bulls especially. But so this, this manger is probably a lower level uh, in the house where the animals are. And so they are in the house, 
but they are in the lowest part of the house with the animals. There is a sense of humility, however. I mean, we picture it, we picture it in our culture, in our world. Um, in their world, there is a humility here though, right? The king of the world is not born, you know, uh, with a silver spoon. The king of the universe is not born uh, to uh, an Augustus-like uh, situation. The king of the world is, is um, with the animals, with the, the common animals, the sheep and, and so forth in his birth laid in a, a manger. Okay, verse eight. And there were shepherds in the same country um, watching over and keeping their flocks by night, um, what, keeping, watching the watch, keeping the, uh, guarding the guards um, by night uh, over their flock. Okay, so we have some shepherds who are out and about uh, at night uh, watching flocks. And um, uh, let's, let's just also say that, that shepherds are not high on the social totem pole. They are, they are pretty lowly dirt uh, in the social status. Um, again, contrast Matthew. Matthew tells us of wise men with gold who come to Jesus, quite different uh, from Luke, where we have lowly, unimportant, dirty, scuzzy shepherds um, who, who uh, recognize Jesus. But again, this is part of the message of Luke, the reversal of fortunes, the, the exaltation of the humble, um, that, that when God announces the birth of, uh, of his Messiah and his son, it is not announced to the, the highfalutin people in Jerusalem. Uh, the high priest doesn't have a vision. You know, the high priest, in, in God's kingdom, the high priest is scuzzy. And in God's kingdom, these shepherds are important. There is a re reversal in the kingdom. Blessed are the poor, um, Jesus says, and woe to the rich. The values of the kingdom are not the values of this world. Not at all. They're topsy-turvy. Verse 9, and the angel of the Lord uh, stood with them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they feared a great fear. Um, uh, this is a common theme that when an, a supernatural, when an angelic being appears to you, you get a little scared, um, and the shepherds do as well. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, do not fear, again, standard script here for an angel when people appear to, to them, for behold, I am announcing Good news, I'm announcing a gospel to you involving great joy, which will be for all the people. Uh, it's not just for the, the hoity-toity. It's not just for the highfalutin. It's not for the rich and famous, um, but it's good news for all the people, all the people, including shepherds. In fact, you shepherds are the first to hear this announcement in the entire world, not Augustus, Augustus will die probably never hearing of Jesus. Augustus will never know that the real king had been born in his empire. But this good news is for all people, not just the important, but for the, the people society thinks are not important. Verse 11, for was born to you today a savior who is Christ the Lord in the city of David. I was mentioning the Priene inscription about Augustus. Uh, the Priene inscription, I believe, calls him a savior. Um, so again, Theophilus, a Roman official, is going to hear the echoes of Augustus, I think, in, in this story. And, and um, Theophilus is going to, going to realize, you know what? Uh, Augustus is dead, but Jesus is alive, and Jesus is risen, and, and our God reigns, and um, uh, Jesus is Lord, and that, that, that we who are Christians have a eternal savior, and a cosmic savior, that there might be a few good rulers uh, occasionally on earth, uh, but our ruler is Jesus, who is the anointed one, the Christ. He is the Lord, um, the, the Lord that Psalm 110.1 talks about. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Verse 12, and this is uh, a sign to you. You will find a baby having been wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Verse 13, and suddenly there came with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God, 
Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Anyway, um, so obviously Handel um, incorporated this event into the Messiah. Um, so the, the angels are now going to sing um, the praises of this event. Verse 14, glory in the highest places to God, or, or gl perhaps glory to God in the highest places. That might be better. And on earth, on the land, peace among men of goodwill. Little variation in some of the manuscripts. Um, um, I remember singing in choir in uh, my college experience at Southern Wesleyan, was Central Wesleyan back then. Um, but we sang um, um, peace, goodwill toward men is the way it is in the King James Version. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Um, but probably the, the more correct manuscript reading is, uh, and peace on earth among people of good, of good pleasure, people with whom God is well pleased. Um, not to people who, not to people who are, are nice people, but to people with, with whom God is well pleased, uh, among people of God's goodwill, because it's what God thinks that matters, not whether, well, I gave a certain amount to this charity. Um, well, God does care about those things, but it's more important that God be pleased with us than that we be pleased with ourselves. So um, verse 15, so the angels sing, uh, and it came to pass as they were departing from them, the angels from in, uh, the angels into the sky or into the heaven, the shepherds were saying to one another, let us go indeed unto Bethlehem and let us see this word that has come to pass. Um, that the Lord has made known to us. Um, and so the shepherds get up. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what they did with their sheep, but I assume sheep need to take a little time to get completely uh, discombobulated. Um, and so they leave their flocks, I assume, and they hurry to Bethlehem, which I assume is not very far. Um, I used to be able to run four miles in, you know, probably uh, less than 35 minutes once upon a time it was it happened a long time ago um so you know even if they were in jerusalem which they're not they could get there uh in a half hour probably um and so the shepherds go for 16 and they came having hurried and they found both mary and joseph uh, and they found the the infant the baby lying in the manger um which you know we're trying to get some sleep here um this is at night the shepherds must wake them Verse 17, and having seen, they proclaimed concerning the saying that had been spoken to them concerning this child. Verse 18, and all those who heard marveled concerning the things that had been spoken by the shepherds to them. Now, I assume this is Joseph's family that we're talking about here, perhaps his parents and others, or maybe their extended family. Um, but everybody is amazed at, you know, that the angels have uh, have seen this great thing. But again, notice, notice how God doesn't always publicly make things known, that God sometimes um, uh, speaks to us in ways that hit the history books aren't going to necessarily capture. Um, it's under the, uh, it's, it's, it's one on one sometimes that God speaks, and it never makes the, the newspaper, and it never makes the, the cable news. Um, but um, those who were around, so for example, this, this birth of, of Jesus, um, what did they think was going on here? You know, maybe they believed Mary, um, or maybe they thought that Joseph just wasn't able to control himself, uh, or, or who knows what they thought. Maybe some of them believed, um, but one way or another, um, uh, there, are, there are signs there are hidden signs. The virgin conception is one of them, and the visit to the angels is another. Signs that if a person has faith, they could believe. Uh, verse 18, and having heard, they marveled concerning the things being spoken by the shepherds to them, um, including Joseph and Mary, I assume. Verse 19, but Mary was storing up these words, pondering them in her heart. Mary doesn't fully understand Mary doesn't understand the magnitude of what's going on here. Um, she just knows, huh, this is, these are really unusual things. There's something really, really important 
uh, going on here. I'm going to put this in my diary uh, and uh, revisit this and ponder this. Um, verse 20, and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God at all the things that they had heard and seen as it was spoken to them. Well, this is only 20 verses, but I spent some time um, talking about some theological issues. And it's very, you know, I'm trying to write these things up. Uh, I, I kind of use the, the podcast video as a uh, kind of dry run. I do a little research. I do this podcast and then I try to write it up. Um, and it takes a long time to write it up. So I hope you won't mind if I stop today with verse 20. It'll um, at least slow down my, my podcast progress um, to at least give my writing um, uh, uh, part of this uh, a chance to catch up. Well, this has been uh, through the Bible uh, in 10 years with Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20.